It's my great pleasure to introduce Chris Nichols. I've known Chris for many years. In fact, I suppose if I, if I think about Southern Italy, I'd probably call him my compare. Anyway, today's story starts back in 1993, when Chris was an investigative journalist for the ABC. His investigation into government Australia legislation here in this state led him to receive the longest serving prison sentence for an Australian journalist. Why? Because he refused to dis disclose his source. Nowadays, Chris works as a, cr as a crisis leadership consultant in the disability sector. Chris's imprisonment shaped his belief that no one is immune from an unanticipated crisis. He advocates that, the cora that courageous leaders need to be emotionally adaptive and mentally prepared for outcomes during a crisis. So please join me in welcoming Chris Nichols. Thank you, Giuliano and uh, Rotarians as well. It's, uh, it's a pleasure to be here, and uh, the President, uh, Paul, as well. Um, I've got to say, I'm very impressed uh, with what you do. Uh, I was seeing, on, I, I looked on your website, there's one particular area that uh, fascinated me, and that was your work in uh, the eradication of polio, um, which are globally, which is something that's very close to my heart uh, from a family perspective from many years ago. Um, but I wanted to, uh, to say uh, how, how much uh, I appreciate the work that you're doing uh, and the, uh, uh, the funds that you raise and the causes that you support uh, as well. Just a, a quick special acknowledgement um, to the table to my left, which, yes, I have my own travelling entourage. Um, I'm surprised that they weren't put on the naughty corner um, because they are quite known to be very vocal and very loud uh, on occasions. Um, but I would like to, to acknowledge uh, my wife, um, who has been uh, with me for 40 plus years and with us. We have four children, three of which are here, James, uh, Johnny and Sherry Lee. Um, Sherry Lee, you'll see, or you'll see the kids uh, shortly in the presentation, much younger uh, as well. And uh, my daughter-in-law, EJ, Emily Jane, and our first granddaughter, Mila Rose. Um, as well. But I'd also like very quickly to, to say a warm welcome to my father-in-law, Leon, uh, as well, and uh, uh, Danny Gugliamucci, who has been an immense support and mentor uh, for me in my own personal journey uh, as well. So thank you guys for coming, uh, and to the rest of you as well. And of course, Michael, who's down the back there, uh, who's uh, my nephew, who's very generously offered to help with the videography uh, as well. So, thank you very much. You, that's it. All right. <laughs> yeah. uh, gosh, this guy had hair once upon a time. Um, it's hard to believe, but uh, choosing what's right over what's easy uh, was never really much of a key focus for me, certainly when I started my uh, career as a journalist in 1986. Um, I had been nicknamed by my colleagues in, when I was working with Channel 10 Eyewitness News as Crusher. Uh, and the reason for that, I was young, tenacious, had hair, um, but I used to kick down the door, pump two in the chest, and then I would ask questions. Um, but I found that come 92, 93, by that stage, I had worked uh, for Channel 10, I'd worked for Channel 7 as Chief of Staff, uh, that was like mustering cats. Um, and then uh, I found that when 92, 93 came along, when I was working as an investigative journalist with the ABC, I myself was not emotionally prepared or really ready to tackle a major crisis and it was on its way. I'm just going to step back very briefly uh, into this little video montage at the moment and hopefully it plays and to give you a little bit of a background we jump back 28 years uh, and uh, it gives you a little bit of a, an idea of what was happening. Late Friday night and Chris Nichols, the former ABC radio journalist, emerged triumphant from the court, having beaten charges of impersonation, false pretenses and fraud. 
These charges arose from his investigation into possible bribery and conflict of interest involving a South Australian government minister, Barbara Weiss, and her de facto, Jim Stitt. The police questioning took place behind closed doors, despite an ever-present and picture-hungry media. They were acting on information and a complaint made... Reporter Chris Nichols is appealing a four-month prison term for contempt of court. Yesterday, after being brought into the city from Yatla Labor Prison, Nichols was led from the Sir Samuel Way building, where no court was available, friends and relatives of Chris Nichols. Just after 10 o'clock this morning, the former ABC journalist was free after doing time in South Australia's highest security prison. So yeah, it's some um, and uh, it's often in the issues of media ethics, uh, in law journals, uh, should a journalist protect their source or not, uh, what are the obligations and rights uh, of a journalist and the protection of uh, a democratic society. Um, so I suppose the issue was really for me at the time, I had a fascination with poker machines, not that I played them. Um, but there was a lot of interest at the time. In 1992, when the legislation was first being muted, uh, the, the government of the day was very keen to have poker machines. There was a lot of money uh, in tax revenue, and still is. Uh, the hoteliers, uh, it was going to breathe new life into hotel, the hotel industry. A lot of them were struggling, so poker machines was going to be a critical uh, uh, influx of cash for them. And of course, the gaming manufacturers were very interested in selling poker machines uh, as well. So there was a big pot of gold at the end of the rainbow for all the key stakeholders when it came to poker machines. I'll never forget that phone call. It was uh, morning. I was sitting at my desk in the ABC when the ABC receptionist put the call through and said, there's a guy on the line who wants to have a chat to you about poker machines. And I said, well, who is it? And she said, well, he's not going to give his name. So I knew from that moment that it was going to be one of those anonymous sources. Uh, and of course, I said, well, look, put him through. And uh, this guy uh, said, you Chris Nichols? I said, yes. And he said, I hear that you've been following this whole issue about the poker machine legislation uh, that's being uh, about to uh, land in state parliament. And I said, yes. And he said, uh, well, I can tell you there's some funny things that are going on behind the scenes with this legislation. And I said, like what? And he said, well, I can give you uh, evidence that money's changing hands between the poker machine industry and a senior cabinet minister. And I said, well, how on earth are you going to be able to do that? And he said, bank records. Well, they say in investigative journalism, if you want to find the truth, you follow the money trail. And the moment he said bank records, I thought, mm-hmm, this is going to be interesting. I didn't know it was to come. But of course, he said no more. Nothing else is going to happen until you give me an undertaking that you're going to protect me and my identity. And I just said, of course. Yeah, it's, that's what you do as a journalist. It was one of the codes of ethics. You don't disclose your source. And the reason why you don't is because people won't come forward with information. So I just flippantly said, yes, of course, uh, not a problem. So we had a meeting. And uh, there was a lot of extensive uh, collaboration that went with ABC Legal at the time. We looked over all the records, weeks went by, there was a lot of editing of uh, what was going to happen and what was not going to happen. Uh, but eventually, uh, my news editor at the time, he said, Chris, he said, it's time for you to go and talk to the minister and get her, uh, give her the right of reply before you put the allegations forward. So we did. We went late one night to, to Parliament House, I think it was after a sitting, it was very early hours of the morning, uh, and she was there with her lawyer. And uh, I had a colleague with me, and I sat down and we went through the records. Uh, and I started talking about her involvement in the poker machine industry and uh, she was very proactive but she was very nervous as well and I got to the smoking gun part and I said so uh, what's your relationship with the poker machine industry and she said what do you mean by that and I said well how do you explain these and I pulled out the bank records which showed money being deposited into a joint account between herself and a her de facto partner Jim Stitt you could have cut the, uh, the air with a knife. Um, that didn't, meeting didn't last very long after that. Um, but of course, the next morning we ran the story uh, and it made its way across uh, throughout the country on the ABC uh, 7.30 report across all the stations. And you can imagine, of course, 
it worked its way uh, into the um, uh, to the o uh, opposition in, the, in Parliament as well. Uh, and they were banging for her scalp. There was no denying that money had changed hands. What occurred after that was that um, within the space of a very short 48 hours, the government decided, uh, let's divert attention away from the real issue, and let's go for let's shoot the messenger. And they did. They took a, a squad from the, the major crime that was working on an abduction case uh, of a young girl, and they gave very uh, uh, explicit instructions that you were going to pursue this uh, case, uh, which some of the officers weren't real keen about um, because they knew that there was a lot of politics behind it, but they did. Uh, and they turned up at the ABC, uh, they raided the offices, uh, they went through, and of course, if you raid the offices of a news uh, newsroom, you're going to be the subject of cameras and microphones and all sorts of things. Uh, but I got to a point where my news editor at the time was get, feeling the heat from Canberra and from Ultimo and Sydney, uh, where the managing director of the ABC gave an ultimatum. Apparently there had been a few complaints uh, from the government of the day uh, saying that they didn't like me. Uh, and my dogged pursuit of the, uh, of the bank records. And so I was given an ultimatum, and the ultimatum was, Chris, if you go quietly, we will pay your legal bills. If you choose not to go quietly, you're on your own. I was in my early 30s, naive, I suppose, in many respects, quite shocked. I don't think it would happen today, uh, and certainly I wouldn't uh, have uh, uh, acquiesced so, uh, so quietly, I suppose, uh, in today's climate. Um, but I remember sitting home with my wife uh, at the time and thinking to myself, I don't know how we're going to cope with this. I had just lost my job. I thought I had chosen what was the right thing to do, and that was expose this issue. It wasn't now, it certainly wasn't going to be easy. We had a mortgage, we just purchased a house, and my wife, as I sat down on the bed with her and explained to her that things were going to get tough, tears welled up in her eyes, and... Um, Yep, it got tough as time went on. So that night we went through the issues, but it was going to be several months before it would uh, come up, go to trial in the district court. So I had to wait. Of course, that idea of innocent until proven guilty uh -uh, wasn't going to happen in my case. I was already guilty, and then I had to prove my innocence. Well, uh, during the trial, I was asked repeatedly, who gave you those records? How did you get those records? And I respectfully adhered to the code of ethics, which said you don't disclose. Um, it would have been quite easy for me to have said, yeah, I can tell you who, and I can show you where, um, and how it all happened. But I thought, no, I'll, I'll stick to my guns on the situation. I'll choose what I believe to be right over what would have been e an easy decision uh, to make. But after several questions, uh, the good news was, it was a Friday night, it was a five day trial, it was set down for five days, it went for five weeks. Um, and at the end of it, the jury came back with a unanimous verdict, uh, not guilty on all nine criminal counts. And I looked across and I mouthed the words, thank you. They were in tears. And I thought, well, you know, this is just, this is just amazing. So we walked outside, my wife and I, and I put my thumbs up, as you can see in the picture there, and I had a phone call, that was the Friday night, and on the Saturday I had a phone call from my lawyers. And they said, uh, Chris, that picture of you um, with your thumbs up in the paper, um, probably shouldn't have done that. And I said, why? And they said, well, because they're pretty upset um, that you, you got off on the criminal charges. Uh, you're back in court again on Monday. And I said, what for? And they said, this time they're going for contempt. And they said, don't worry about it. It's all good. Contempt. They said, uh, most people, Darren Hinch did the funny farm for 14 days. Um, you know, there's another journalist who may have had a week, uh, so they said, worst case scenario, in this situation you'll probably get a slap on the wrist uh, with a fine, uh, you may get a suspended sentence, but uh, most likely it'll be community service. So I went there, my wife and I went there on the Monday, we thought, not a problem, uh, we sh we'll get through this, so we didn't even prepare for the kids to be picked up, uh, uh, sorry, we, we thought we would be home in time from the kids' school to pick them up. We made arrangements for our eldest son to be picked up because we knew that his, his school was finishing a little bit earlier than that. Um, but of course, uh, as I uh, sat down uh, in the court, I found that um, it wasn't quite going according to plan because during the course of that contempt court proceedings on the Monday, 
the, uh, the a senior prosecutor burst in through the back of the court, walked straight up to the judge's bench, I didn't think, oh, I didn't think you could do that, and said, you, me, we're out in chambers. And I thought, well, that's pretty game. And so they all went off into the, uh, into the, the, uh, the chambers with my lawyers in tow, and after about half an hour they came back and I noticed there was a very different expression and demeanor on the judge. And as he came back, he said, Chris, I'm going to give, Mr. Nichols, I'm going to give you another opportunity to disclose your source uh, before I hand my sentence down. And again, I said, I was thinking to myself, maybe this isn't quite going according to plan here. And uh, he said, uh, so I said, look, out of complete respect for your honor, I said, no disrespect to the court, but no, I'm not going to. So he said, right, you got four months in maximum security. But if you disclose your source, you can come out immediately. Well, of course, it was like a bombshell uh, within the court because none of us, not even my peers or colleagues at the time, were expecting that. My wife burst into tears at the time. Uh, she was d devastated. Uh, as I was being led out by the court sheriff, the court sheriff who'd sat with me through the whole five weeks, she burst into tears. I said, what are you crying for? I'm the one who's going to prison, she said, Chris. She said, I've never seen anything like this. She said, I've seen lawyers and doctors and judges and all sorts of, and their kids and all the rest of it get off on you name, but, but she said, she said I'm just, I didn't think I'd see this day. So I got led down into the holding cells and they took my belt and my uh, pen and my shoelaces and anything that I could do harm. And they, uh, I waited for my lawyers. They said, the lawyers are on their way. And I said, I bet they are. We're going to have a chat. And so of course, when they, they arrived, uh, they were saying, just give up your source. That was the easy thing. But I remember thinking, well, I can't. I've made this stand. It's the right thing to do. And I'm not going to give up the source. So as time went on, I got thrown in the back of the paddy wagon, a little cage. Um, I could, it was ironic, really, because I remember as a journalist reporting on the, the new ice cream. We used to call them the ice cream trucks for, the, for Yatla as they came through. And we used to get squirt, and, uh, and I actually uh, interviewed the, the trucks on these occasion. But they said, um, in the back here, they handcuffed me and they put me in the back. And I remember instinctively, at one point, looking up through the van skylight that they had, and I saw this. And I could not believe it. I'm thinking to myself, this is just so unfair. The minister had been found guilty of three conflicts of interest by a government inquiry uh, and was allowed to stay. And I was on my way to prison for disclosing the three conflicts of interest. And it was hard. My wife, at that stage, you know, coming out of the court, she had that, uh, you know, those ridiculous questions that reporters ask, well, how do you feel? And they, well, how do you expect I feel? Um, and, but the interesting thing was that the shoe was on the other foot. Suddenly, instead of being the reporter or the journalist uh, and interviewing people, I was on the other end. I was on the receiving end. And it brought a whole new dimension for me that people are people. And we have to be careful about what we say about people. Uh, because people have feelings, and they do get hurt, and I was about to experience a lot of that. So finally, we, we worked our way through the, uh, the front gates, and I, I remember seeing these gates because I'd stood out there on many occasions standing out there and thinking my, and reporting about live events, industrial disputes, prison riots, you name it, I was there uh, reporting back live into the, into the newsroom, never once believing that I was going to be on the other side of those walls. They put me in E Division, which was the semi-transient uh, unit there, as the 3 by 25 meter wide uh, cell. Uh, I remember having a chat to the prison warden at the time, and I suggested a little bit of humor might get me somewhere on this. And I said, look, you know, it'd be a lot cheaper if you put me in the Grand Hotel uh, and put me in a house arrest or in a room there, and then, then for you to put me in, in prison here. And he didn't see the joke or the, the humor in that at all. Uh, but now I had to make a decision about choosing courage over comfort. And I didn't like it, I'll be honest with you. I struggled with it. As I lay down that first night in that cold cell, I recoiled immediately because the pillow stunk of alcohol and it looked like it had blood stains all over it. And I thought to myself, how on earth am I going to spend 19 hours out of every 24 locked inside this thing? The reality is, as I was defined many years later, that life is indiscriminate. We will all experience crises during our lifetime. And the choice that we have is we can either become bitter or we can become better. For many years, resentment and anger had welled up inside. 
I became very depressed. Uh, I was in my own prison window, I suppose, and I struggled with the whole injustice of the thing. Yes, there are those who will see, I suppose, look, we live in a planet of 7.9 billion people. And here I was thinking that I had made a difference, and at that point I didn't feel like I'd made any difference at all. And when you look at a planet of 7.9 billion people, you think to yourself, what can one person hopefully achieve? Who's going to listen to just one person? Choosing what's right over what's easy, was it really worth it? There seemed to be no justice. My family and I had paid the price. And what difference had it really made in the end? Well, I can say that one person can actually make a difference in this world. And that's why I talk about the power of one. It would take a further 28 years, I think it was, or 25 years before the government, it was a change of government to bring about shield laws that would protect journalists today. We didn't have it back in those days. But today we do have shield laws. We're not there yet, but it's a step in the right direction. But I suppose the issue is, is that I know that there are many other journalists who've paid a much greater price than I have. And I understand that, and I take my hat off to them. There are those who have lost their lives for reporting the truth in a less than democratic society. But one person can make a difference. And that's what I want to encourage you today. I wanted to introduce you to this woman. This lady, for 10 years, fought and fought to bring about the right for women to vote in, Australia, in South Australia. Three attempts failed over that 10 year period. It wasn't very nice to her, the press at the time. The male establishment was not very inviting of the idea of women having a right to vote and stand for parliament. Well, on 18th of December 1984, the South Australian Parliament Adult Suffrage Bill. Her name is Elizabeth Webb Nichols. And my great grandmother challenged the belief that women of her day were not emotionally or intellectually incapable of properly participating in politics. That, I suppose, that vote that happened in 19, uh, 1894 became the first constituent or the first uh, political or parliament in the world to pass laws that would allow women to stand for parliament. Our decision to act with integrity applies equally in all walks of our lives, be it home, work, caring for those less fortunate, even the homeless, our most vulnerable people, those with a disability. And as you may discover in my book, in Whistling in the Dark, I do not stand before you as the last bastion of honesty and integrity. I have made my mistakes. And I thank God that they put erasers on the ends of pencils because you don't have to scratch the surface too, too far to realize that I'm a mere mortal and I've made my mistakes as well. Each of us, regardless of race, gender, age, beliefs, we can choose to learn from life's challenges and crises that we will face. We have the choice in facing our crisis of becoming either bitter or better. We can choose to languish, or we can choose to learn. My experience reminds me that all of us can find courage over comfort. And whilst it is hard to see at the time, I now see my imprisonment and what occurred to me as a worthy cause in developing in myself character and strength to achieve extraordinary things in the future. With public trust in our political 
and business leaders at an all-time low, and certainly with the COVID pandemic that we face now. Our world cries out for ordinary people to fashion themselves to leaders who are prepared to stand for a worthy cause and to help others to achieve the same whatever the crisis we face. I finish with this quote from US President Theodore Roosevelt, who once said, it is not the critic who counts, not the man or woman who points out how the strong man stumbles or where the doer of deeds could have done them better. The credit belongs to the man or woman who is actually in the arena, whose face is marred by dust and sweat and blood. Thank you for your time. What a fascinating story for us, eh? Um, we have time for questions. We have lots of time for questions. And um, I saw John's hand jump up very quickly. So, John? Sir, after you got out of prison, uh, did you get a job fairly easily, or uh, just what happened to you? No, the short answer is no, I didn't. Um, at the time, I had been, the, the, the advertiser was very proactive and very supportive of me of the stand that I took until I went there and asked for a job. I remember sitting in the news editor's office and he said, oh, hang on, we're coming into an election and it could affect our uh, advertising, the political advertising revenue that the government uh, will do. So come back in 12 months' time. Uh, so, no, it was very difficult um, to get a job after that, uh, but that was part of what I call the years of gathering, of learning, that uh, the, my stand would upset some people, or well, actually upset a lot of people. Um, it took me, I, I then went, sorry, uh, John, to, to very quickly say, I went from um, prison into politics, and I can tell you which crooks are worse. All right. Um, but that was the, uh, the, the journey that I, I had uh, as well. So I went, into the, uh, I went uh, in, into the Senate and then I went to work in Queensland in politics and <laughs> that's another whole story. <laughs> I'll tell you that one. That was even worse than what happened here. Um, but that's another, another story for another day. So it was very difficult to get a job. Um, Joe? Did you ever get a thank you from the person you protected and do you hold any grudges against that person? No. Look, I stumbled into this. I didn't go in there really knowing what was going to happen. Um, and so when I gave my undertaking, Joe, I, um, it was a case of uh, I had made an undertaking. We had met uh, during the course of the trial. Um, we were kind of looking over our shoulder and sort of checking to see what was around uh, at the time. Um, he was very upset naturally, because he hadn't anticipated the extent. Maybe we should have. I think we're probably naive in many respects. But uh, none of us had uh, anticipated what had happened. We met after I came out. Uh, he, was a, he was more emotional wreck than I was um, at the end. Um, but yeah, he saw firsthand uh, the extent that uh, when you upset your, your enemies, you are going to pay the, uh, the price. Uh, so he was very, very thankful for the fact that I maintained I can't even remember the guy's name now, to be honest with you. Um, <laughs> at, uh, but no, I have never. I've been, my wife has asked me on many occasions, and I said, no, you know, I'm not telling. <laughs> uh, but no, so but yeah. Uh, thanks, David. Uh, just one more. Um, did the minister ever get any comeback with karma? Or did she just stay rich from it? Um, look, I, I can say with all honesty that she and her partner went to, she retired on a government pension, uh, went to Perth and worked in the poker machine industry there for a number of years uh, in Jim Stitt's consulting and then uh, worked in, I think, the Land Development Corporation for the government of the day. Uh, and still, I think, from, uh, as, as far as I know, still resides uh, in Perth on a government pension um, uh, as well. So I tried to get some information and they just said, oh, no, you're not getting that one under cabinet documents. So, <laughs> uh, so yes, we have a question down here. Uh, thanks very much. Uh, thanks for sharing your story, Chris. And thanks for your leadership. Courage is courageous and is also contagious. A uh, question that I may ask, how were you treated inside? Uh, look, they, 
um, it was a, it was an interesting dilemma because there were various people who um, thought I, from an officer's point of view, they thought I was in there as a plant. Uh, I said, no, 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 I'm not. I'm, I'm here because I have to be here, not because I want to be here. Um, there were some officers who were, wanted to make an example of me. So there was one particular occasion where I went uh, into a cell with a, a convicted murderer who I ended up. Re I found out that I had reported on in 1986. And, um, and they, I shared a cell with him because he had color TV and he also had the run of the joint. Um, but they came to me and they said, look, you know, not a good idea. You shouldn't be doing this. You know, this is really bad. You know, he's, he's got a reputation. He's been in four years. He's got life and blah. And they told me, and I said, look, I actually um, trust him more than I trust you. So that meant more strip searches, more bending over the mirrors, more cavity searches, uh, all the rest of it. So it came with its, uh, its issues. There were some other really decent officers who were there and they used to smuggle in oysters. Um, uh, as well, and so um, there were some funny things that happened uh, that were in there. Um, but yeah, and then there, there, were, there were inmates who had all, were all innocent um, and had a story to tell uh, and wanted to, my, me to take up their case uh, on their behalf, and then there were others who wanted to kill me uh, as well, which is kind of why they put me in E Division, because it was at least to some degree semi-protection. Okay. Uh, Danny with Jeff. Thank you. Thank you for your talk. Thanks, Jeff. <clears throat> um, just wondering uh, how, or, or if you could paint a picture of the position that journalists are in today. There's the Witness K thing going on in Canberra. Um, there's a lot of hint of corruption with various politicians and stuff, federal, state, all that sort of stuff. And the stakes are as high, if not higher now. So yeah. what's the situation for journalists? Good question, Jeff. Um, a recent survey was done about journalists in 2015 about the extent of what they knew in terms of uh, protection of sources, legislation, those sorts of things. Um, most of them, 90% of them, had no idea to the extent that they were being monitored or looked at uh, in today's social media. Uh, you don't need to protect a source. They know it. They just <laughs> they can do facial recognition. They can do anything uh, these days. I worked with a pest gallery in Canberra for a, pe a short period of time. Um, which was an interesting uh, experience, uh, to say the least. A lot of stuff happens that doesn't um, really get reported on um, because of the connections and the relationships. Uh, you hear about it, but you don't read about it. Okay. So just as a final question over here to Frank, hopefully we can understand him. <laughs> Firstly, thank you for uh, your courage and leadership. Uh, do you think ICAC has made any difference to your professional colleagues in this field? Uh, there seems to be some disarray there, but at least it is uh, an opportunity to have an investigation made of corruption in the public sector. That's my next speech here. Um, I became a, uh, a witness at a Royal Commission against the Criminal Justice Commission, which is the equivalent of ICAC uh, here. Um, I think ICACs are very good. Uh, so I've got a lot of time for them. I think that they're a step in the right direction, but who guards the guards? Um, my testimony in Queensland at the Royal Commission, it was the only time that a Royal Commission was shut down in 1997 and never allowed to report its findings, um, is that uh, they can become a law unto themselves. Uh, so they're a, they're a necessary uh, part of our process. It's better to have one, but there has to be better accountability. Uh, with it. So you're going to get dodgy journalists, you're going to get dodgy doctors, uh, lawyers, uh, psychologists, uh, all sorts of, there's always going to be a bad egg in there um, at some point. So there is a necessity to have that type of public forum. Um, that's my next book. <laughs> uh, well, Rotarians and guests, what a privilege it is to be a Rotarian and listen to stories like this. Um, it gives me great pleasure to present Chris um, the certificate which uh, certifies that we'll be making a donation on your behalf to the Rotary Club of Adelaide Local Community and Youth Projects. Please thank Chris as I present this. Thank you so much.